Good morning. This is an abbreviated version of the talk that was given on Saturday morning. Uh, this talk is now being recorded directly to the computer and so will not include the questions that the audience asked. I wanted to thank everyone for coming to my talk and I wanted to begin by introducing some of the amazing things that honeybees do in terms of their communication system and how I was actually inspired to study honeybee communication, focusing on this interesting question of can honeybees communicate danger to other bees inside the nest. This is the outline for the talk. And I'd like to begin with the idea of the superorganism. This is from Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, and the idea is that the sum of the parts is actually far greater than the individual contributions. Here we have the Leviathan, the kingdom, which is the creation of the individual people. And similarly, in an observation colony or a honeybee hive, you have multiple individual bees that are acting together. But the kind of sophisticated behavior that they can show is actually far greater than the sum of their individual parts. And this is why we care in many ways about honeybee behavior because honeybees can teach us about complex cooperative phenomena. For example, one interest that many engineers and computer scientists have currently is how swarm robotics can play a role in using biological algorithms, what bees can teach us using simple rules and simple, relatively speaking, sensory systems to be able to coordinate the motions of these robots and also their actions. The idea is that in the future we could use what the bees can teach us to build better autonomous robot units that will work together and cooperate. But there's also something else that you're using right now watching this presentation and that of course is the human brain. We think of the human brain as being composed of individual neurons and while each neuron is fairly sophisticated what they achieve as the whole, for example, human consciousness, human language, is far greater than the sum of their individual parts. This brings us to the concept of neuronal excitation and inhibition. So here you see a beautiful brain bow image of the hippocampus in which individual neurons are shown in different colors. The idea is that the brain can get excited one neuron can send an excitatory signal that activates another neuron. But equally important is inhibition. Imagine if every single neuron in your brain was firing at the same time. The result would be chaos. And so really when people say you're only using 10% of your brain at a time, your, the typical response should be that is as it should be or thank goodness because if everything was going on there would be chaos. This brings us to the concept of inhibition. Some neurons can prevent other neurons from firing, and this is equally as important as excitation because it helps to organize and to build a more complex and stable system. Inhibitory signals do occur in complex social organisms. For example, in the pharaoh's ant, what you see is a no-entry odor pheromone. Ants will lead odor trails going from the nest to a food source but if the food source has become exhausted, the ant can mark the entrance of that odor trail with a pheromone that says, essentially, do not go here, there is no good food or no good resource. So this inhibits other ants from going down the pheromone trail. Now, Carl von Frisch is famous for discovering the honeybee dance language. So here we see Carl von Frisch and then here we see a bee that is waggle dancing. This bee has been filmed in high speed and now is being slowed down for you to see in greater detail what's going on. You can see that she's dancing and she's communicating the distance and direction to the food source. What's fascinating is that one bee finds a food, she returns inside the nest, starts dancing, and she repeats this recruiting more bees. This creates a positive feedback because these other bees can find the food and also come back to dance. So from one to two to four to eight, you can see how rapidly this process can build up. 
The question, therefore, is do bees possess an inhibitory signal that can block this process, preventing it from building up, preventing a bee from recruiting her nestmates? We'll leave the question of why she would want to do this uh, for later on. First, bees encounter dangers in their natural world. So here we see an ambush predator, a spider, and it is attacking and eating a, a bumblebee. Here you also see another spider eating a solitary bee. What's interesting is shown in the red here that bees, flies, and other hymenoptera have a high probability of being attacked, but only for the flies do you have a high probability of success. Bumblebees, which are social, and other hymenoptera, which include honeybees, have the ability to communicate their experiences to other bees inside the nest. Now, it doesn't have to be a direct communication. So here you see that the number of waggle dances that a bee produces has decreased when she returns from a dangerous site as compared to a safe site. So a bee can just choose not to recruit, not to provide the positive feedback. Here's another predator, an ambush bug. And here's a predator we'll talk more about later on, a wasp and a honeybee nest. This is the work right now of a recently graduated master's student, Alison Bray, and here you see a victorious praying mantis. Allison was interested in looking at whether bees would avoid these dangerous predators, and she saw that regardless of their size, in these two cases, first and third instar, bees avoided dangerous feeders with a mantis. Let's take a look at a video of a mantis attacking and killing a bee. So what you just saw was the mantis eating essentially the brains of the bee that she had caught. And we were interested whether bees would avoid such a dangerous feeder. Here you see results that we were preparing. And on the y-axis, we have the average number of dance circuits. On the x-axis, we have how bees respond before in the white bars and then after in the gray bars to different treatments. When they see or smell a mantis at a feeder, they reduce waggle dancing. The same for when a mantis is successful and actually kills another bee. However, when there is no mantis, you can see there is no significant difference before and after. So they do dance less for dangerous food when there is a live predator present. And honeybees can reduce positive feedback. So one question, is there an inhibitory signal to counter recruitment? What if a bee is attacked at a food source? Can she tell other bees of her experiences and prevent recruitment to that food source? Why would this occur in nature? Well, in some cases, though rarely, we have competition for floral resources. In other cases, we can artificially induce a kind of nest robbing analogy where we have a very rich sugar solution in a time of relative scarcity. Here you can see it being swarmed by many bees. This is an image of a hive that is being robbed and this can happen both in commercial apiaries and also in the wild where bees are robbing each other's nests. I'm going to be talking about the stop signal, which I will give away as something which is an inhibitory signal against the waggle dance. But first I want you to see what it is. Watch and listen. You saw two, or a repetition, two times, a bee coming down from the top and hitting this bee in the bottom, which by the way came from the same food source, and vibrating her body. The fundamental frequency is 328 hertz, and it lasts about 150 milliseconds. This behavior causes the bee to initially freeze when she receives the signal. It turns out that when a feeder is overcrowded, more stop signals are produced. So this is one type of adverse situation that will cause stop signals. 
Stop signals were originally thought to be a begging signal. However, in initially looking at this in 1993, I found that no dance followers received food after signaling. In fact, this was the first honeybee research that I did, and it inspired me to continue in this area. Similarly, Pastor and Seeley saw that no waggle dancers gave food to a signaler after receiving a signal, and they observed dances for natural food sources. So it's not a begging signal. They're not getting food. What is it? Kirchner showed that the number of waggle dances decreased and recruitment for a feeder decreased after the playback of stop signals. Waggle dancers, I also found, have a significantly higher probability of departure after receiving a natural or an artificial signal. The same effect occurs on dancers for natural food sources. This is the work of Pastor and Seeley. And then finally, in a related topic, but one that I'm not going in depth into, dancers for nest sites will also inhibit other dancers using stop signals. So what are the methods and results of this experiment? So here we have our site in the biology field station at UCSD. You can see that we trained bees to a site 100 meters northeast, or what we don't see, there was also another site 100 meters southwest. So we have two students taking care of the feeder and monitoring what's going on. Inside the nest, we have another person who's recording the behavior of bees inside the nest with a microphone that's used to track a focal bee. You can see the focal bee is individually painted on her back. You can also see here a frozen moment in time in which a stop signaler is butting her head and signaling a waggle dancer. The first question, are stop signals targeted at bees visiting the same food source? The experiment is to have two identical feeders each 100 meters from the nest, and we would apply the same or different odors to the bees. We could have a different odor treatment, different odors at each location, or they can be the same odor. We used lemon and peppermint odors, and we would swap them randomly. The result is that regardless of whether a bee went to a north feeder or a south feeder, it really didn't matter which odor she, re she experienced, as long as the odors at these feeders were different, she would always know to target bees visiting the same feeder. If in another experiment we made both feeders present the same odor to the bees, then this was abolished and bees no longer showed discrimination. So the answer is that yes, they can target bees that are visiting the same feeder based upon the odor. In nature, many of the plants that we think of as being one species can have subtle variations in their odor. For example, thyme here has multiple chemotypes. This is basically an expression of the genetics of the plant. It smells a little bit different depending upon whether it's a G or a T chemotype. And it turns out that bees can tell this difference. Using specially built chambers, we were able to pump the whole odor volatiles coming from these different chemotypes of plants and show that bees can distinguish them. They can distinguish between the rewarded and the unrewarded chemotype. And in aversive assays, we were able to show that bees, when attacked in a simulated way by being pinched, they would stick out their stinger and they could associate this attack with exposure to an odor. So basically, if a bee was attacked by a spider on one chemotype, it would learn that that was a dangerous chemotype, but it would not associate the danger with the other chemotype, which is the same species, but smells slightly different. Bees have a fine ability to discriminate odors. The next question is, are stop signals elicited by attacks during feeder competition and robbing? What we did is we had controlled competition from feral bees at a feeder, we recorded the behavior of focal foragers before and after attacks. This is the beginning of a competition trial. The focal bees were all labeled, and the competitors, the feral bees, were unmarked. 
At the end of the competition trial, there were always many more of these feral bees because we only used smaller three-frame observation colonies. Here you can see that typically we would start off each day and we would have recruitment shown in black bars from our bees and then it was discovered by feral bees and then this would increase so that now we have more competitors present. You would also have an increase in the number of stop signals over time. You can see that now there's a low level of stop signaling and this increases to a high level during this competition. So there is something about the competition that is triggering stop signals. Looking in detail, we compared what a bee did before and after. Before, in this case, something was happened to her, and after, in this case, um, when she was dis undisturbed. So this is basically a control, and there is no change in any of the behaviors measured. However, if a bee was an attacker, she was attacking the feral bee visiting the feeder, there was also no change in any of the behaviors measured. <laughs> However, if a bee was a victim, you would see a significant increase in the number of stop signals. If she was a victim of attack, she would produce more stop signals. She would also waggle dance less, and she would produce more tremble dances. So what are the proximate causes of this? Well, we know that biting commonly occurs during feeder aggression. Biting is a general strategy of many ambush predators. Does biting elicit stop signals? We simulated this by pinching foragers with tweezers. We found, through a careful video analysis, that body parts most often attacked were the leg, thorax, and wing, and therefore we focused on the leg as being a naturally attacked body part that was easily accessible. Here's the control. We have tweezers next to the leg, but we're not pinching it. Here's the pinching treatment, where we are pinching the leg, but not damaging it. The bee could still walk normally, and could even waggle dance, in some cases, inside the nest. Alarm pheromone is released during a bee attack, so does alarm pheromone release or elicit stop signals? We actually extracted the alarm pheromone in hexane and presented it in syringes. Here's an example of what happens. You can see that the bee is now avoiding the odor of the sting gland. Here's the example of the control with only the hexane. In fact, there is no avoidance. So this is the behavior of the bee before pinching. This is light blue, light blue, side to side, and the main thing to notice is that she is not producing any stop signals. This is what happens when she returns to the nest after being pinched. Second stop signal. Third. Fourth. Fifth. Sixth. Seventh.
Notice here that she's delivering multiple stop signals against this bee, which has a dark blue thorax. The bee is right here. Well, she goes on like this for some time. So basically what happened is that when she was pinched, she had the strongest, on average, bees that were pinched had the strongest response compared to any of the other previous stimuli, much more than being a victim. More stop signals, significantly fewer waggle dances, actually down to zero, and they spent much more time inside the nest. In fact, one bee stayed inside the nest and performed over 250 stop signals. If they were exposed to sting glands, they had an increased signaling, producing production of stop signals, but it was less than the response to pinching. So the response is apparently tailored to the degree of danger that a bee experiences. Because when she was exposed to the sting gland, she just smelled the alarm of another bee, but was not herself physically contacted or harmed. And then finally, the mandibular gland did not elicit any response at all. And this shows that it's not just liquid or fluid from a bee gland that's important for eliciting the stop signal. It has to be something that is related to alarm at a food source. So what about predators? Do attacks by real predators increase stop signal production? Here is a lynx spider that we found at the field station and that we immediately harnessed by gluing it to a small paper tag and we attacked the honeybee at the feeder. We also found another common predator and these are wasp attacks. This graph shows the severity of wasp attacks. Zero is just the wasp approaching and the bee backing away. Four is both of them falling to the ground, grappling, fighting to the death. And what you can see is that when the wasp is presented to a bee, very often she will attack it. We also developed these electromechanical tweezers that we calibrated for consistent attacks. Essentially, what is happening here is that we are pinching the bee in order to make sure, with a very consistent force, that it's being treated the same way each time. And this force was within the range of what some insects, for example ants, can generate with their mandibles. The results? were that after examining many stop signals and dances, we were able to show that the robo-spider, the attack wasp, and the attack spider were all significantly able to elevate stop signal production. However, stalking with a recently dead wasp or a recently dead spider that could not attack but was presented close to the bee, where the bee could see and smell it, did not elicit more stop signals. 
In terms of waggle dance circuits, a similar effect occurred. Basically, being presented with a or attacked with a robo spider, a live wasp, or a live spider results in decreases in the production of waggle dancing. However, being stalked by a wasp or a spider did not. So the experimental treatments altered waggle dancing and stop signals, but the controls did not. So the conclusions are that stop signals are targeted at bees visiting the same food source. Three to four fold more signals are delivered to same feeder bees. Victims of attack produce 43 times more signals after attack. Pinching increased stop signals by 88 fold. And sting gland increased signal production by 14 fold. Mandibular gland and hexane only controls had no effect. In terms of predator attacks, 3.3 fold more signals were produced after attack by live predators. Two fold more stop signals were produced after attack by the robo spider. There were fewer waggle dance circuits after attack by the robo spider and natural predators. And there was no significant response to the odor of fresh dead predators. So this takes us to the broader question. Why do we need to have a negative feedback signal? We've seen in the previous experiment that danger at a food source being attacked by a live predator or by the robo spider can actually elicit stop signals. And you would imagine that that should affect an individual's experience. But even though a bee has experienced danger, how does she influence the behavior of other bees that were not attacked? The stop signal allows her to inform recruiters for the same food source that she has experienced danger. It's a way for her to communicate, in essence, the danger that she experienced. Now, one big picture question is why so few of these examples of inhibitory signals are known in superorganisms? And I think the answer is that we need to look. Part of our looking is science education, and we really emphasize stewardship for the next generation, working with a variety of students. For example, ORBS is a program for community college students to get research experience in the lab and to encourage them to transition to four-year colleges and universities. Another place that you can look is the Teaching Bee. If you Google the Teaching Bee, you should find the site. Each of these petals has different information. In particular, Let's think about the four educators link. Recently, working with Jesse Wade Robinson and Eben Goodale, we came up with a high school science curriculum that addresses three national science standards and works on multiple skills involved in the scientific method. But perhaps more importantly for us, it also teaches an appreciation of bees and understanding why they're important to our environment. As you can see from the title of this article, which was published in The American Biology Teacher, we actually used our experiments about honeybees could avoid predators for this curriculum. And the entire curriculum can actually be found at the Teaching Bee website. If you click on the Four Educators link, you will find the PowerPoints, the worksheets, and the lesson plans. Also, you can look us up on Facebook. You can Google my name, James Nye, or The Teaching Bee, and that is a Facebook group. You can look for the YouTube channel, The Teaching Bee, and you'll see many of the videos that we've shown here and some of the student videos that they did as part of their presentations. And if you're interested in learning more about our research on inhibitory communication in superorganisms like bees, you can click on the link highlighted here in red. Well, in closing, I would like to thank the many people that helped to make this research possible and the granting agencies that funded part of these studies. Thank you for your listening.